It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hey, friends, this is Andy. This episode of Accelerate is brought to you by KiteDesk. KiteDesk is the all-in-one sales development platform that lets you manage all of your sales development activities, such as email, direct dial phone calls, and your daily to-dos, all in one place to open up conversations, book more qualified meetings, and really create a predictable pipeline. KiteDesk Flow and KiteDesk Find allows us to find exactly the right people in the industries we're looking for in the roles that we're looking for. That's KiteDesk customer Michael Orfis. Michael is head of sales at Stratified. In addition to the all-in-one management of his sales development team's days, KiteDesk helps him with another big part of his job. We have the ability with KiteDesk to do what we call targeted campaigns. Our conversion rate from what we were doing in the past to what we're doing now has been really massive. So you don't have to take tons of time to research, prospect, then blast large lists of people that never turn into sales opportunities. We're seeing higher clicks, we're seeing higher open rates, and without question, we've seen a massive increase in pipeline generation. So to learn more about KiteDesk, schedule a free demo, and learn how to create predictable pipeline at your sales organization, go to kitedesk.com forward slash accelerate. That's K-I-T-E-D-E-S-K dot com slash accelerate. Hello, and welcome to Accelerate. I am excited to talk with my guest today. Joining me is Craig Wartman. Craig is CEO and founder of Sales Engine, Inc. He's also a clinical professor of entrepreneurship at University of Chicago Business School and the author of a book called What's Your Story? Using Stories to Ignite Performance and Be More Successful. Craig, welcome to Accelerate. Andy, thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here. I really appreciate the time. So, uh, I'm sort of curious. So, <laughs> clinical professor, that makes it sound almost medical. <laughs> it uh, <does. laughs> Or you're a psychiatrist or something. So, <laughs> how's the clinical play into entrepreneurship? Or, or my students just think I'm clinically insane. It's, it could be any of any of the above. Um, <laughs> it is. It's actually a designation that is uh, meant to uh, uh, cause you to think of one of two things, which is we have. So at University of Chicago and the and the Booth School in particular, we have two types of faculty. One is a tenure track research professor. And one is a clinical. And clinical simply means, in our parlance, it simply means a practitioner. Got it. So I, I kind of have, I'm super lucky uh, as a person, I have the best of both worlds. So I, I'm a practitioner. So I get to do the do during the day, and then I teach the do at night. Got so it. That's, what, that's simply what clinical means. A weird word, but uh, for a very simple concept. <laughs> All right. Well, I just had to ask. So, um, so how'd you get your start in sales? Maybe fill out an introduction of yourself, and how'd you get into academia? Yeah. So, uh, again, there's some luck that, you know, some timing and some luck that plays in about 25 years ago. It's receding into the past, of course, as I get older, but about 25 years ago, I got hired by IBM. I was a, a, a political guy. I was in um, a congressional office in Washington, D.C., and they luckily plucked me out of uh, D.C. and put me into 13 uh, fantastic zip codes on the south side of Chicago selling the AS400. Some of your listeners will <laughs> be always, familiar I with know, the AS400. I, I remember the AS400, but it uh, <laughs> seems like a tough market. Well, when I say that to my MBA students, Andy, they kind of look at me like, AS what? And so because yeah, you have to be a certain age to remember the AS400, but still around. Uh, unfortunately, I um, am, yes. I sold, you and me both, I sold a, a, a bunch of those on the south side of Chicago. And just, I, you know what, I had, a, I had a blast. As I look back on that tenure, I was terrified I was excited. Um, all of those things, you know, wrapped into one nervous, twitching bundle. And I, but I learned a hell of a lot. I mean, I what I always say to people is, I am forever thankful for what IBM gave me. They took a scared kid uh, from politics and they put me on the south side of Chicago and said, "Kid, walk the streets until you figure out what you're doing." And they gave me, of course, you know, they didn't cut me loose. They gave me a ton of help, a ton of training, a ton of mentoring, and that's that's how I got my start. And I, I I'll tell you. And I, I do mean I was terrified. I was, you know, I didn't know business and I certainly didn't know selling. And IBM helped me sort of discover both of those things. Mm -hmm. And so it's just really fun to look back on. And I, I fell in love with it. So I fell in love with this notion of selling and solving people's problems and helping a company, you know, perform better and, and get um, 
you know, get up that, that learning curve and that performance curve. So then, and what I didn't know is that was sort of planting the seeds to academia. And I have to be really careful with you and your, and your community. Because when I say academia, I'm not, I don't really consider myself an academic. I'm a salesperson. I'm an entrepreneur. Yes, I get lucky and I get to stand in front of the world's most talented business school students and talk about this. But what I've, what I've discovered is at IBM, the seeds were really planted because I'm now eight years in at Chicago Booth teaching my crazy MBA class. I continually, quarter by quarter, get to explore what actually is persuasion, what does it look like, what is influence, and how does that all roll up into sales? Right. So, sorry, that was a long-winded answer, but it's, a, it's been a circuitous, sort of interesting journey um, that's led me to uh, to teaching this. Well, so the course title, at least one of the courses you teach, is called Entrepreneurial Selling. Right. So that's sort of interesting because, you know, obviously in biz school, a lot of the focus is on startups, entrepreneurialism. Um, but sales is oftentimes pretty foreign to that, that student body. Uh, it is. And I will tell you, it's even more foreign at the elite MBA level. And I, I, I hope this doesn't come across as swagger. But, you know, Chicago Boots has been very fortunate. We are often ranked either number one or top three in the world. So at an elite institution, there is a, um, you know, there's a, there's a. They look down their nose at sales. They can. <laughs> and that's, thank you. Let's, you said let's it, cut through it. <laughs> I was trying to figure out a nice way to say that, but you, you said it for me. Yeah. Right. I mean, that, there's, it's, it, look, it's interesting. Um, Harvard Business School just launched a, a, a course on, on entrepreneurial selling. We've got one. Kellogg's working on it. Uh, some fantastic business schools like McCombs and Foster, McCombs in Texas and Foster in Seattle, Washington, are working on it. So the message is getting out, and it's so fun to watch that happen and to help. I get to help from the sidelines a bunch of these schools, all the ones I've included, to, to try to launch these classes. But, you know, there are. There, there's, there's some traditionalists at business schools who sort of look at this and go, wait, why are we teaching these people sales? And I think, you know, people like you and people like me and your community kind of look at that and go, wait, what? Really? This is, you know, revenue, we're, we're, we're trading on the assumption that revenue is actually important to businesses. And when you say it like that, people kind of go, you know what, that is true. Let's figure out a way that we can really teach this stuff and help our entrepreneurs, um, you know, what I say is, is first survive and then thrive in what I call the wonderful chaos from time zero to break even. I've been there three times over. I've been in that wonderful chaos. I have failed and I've succeeded and I've felt the burn of that, that wonderful chaos. And we've designed a course that really tries to help entrepreneurs just kick some butt through that process. All right. Nice political reference with feel the burn there. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, we are recording this in the midst of the presidential election season. Yes, it'll, we are. It'll air slightly after. By the time people hear this, we'll, <laughs> we'll know what the results of the election are. But um, so, you know, you focus, yeah, really on, you know, selling for a small business and for a startup, which, you know, I, I worked for eight different startup companies in my career before starting my own companies, nine if you start my own, count my own. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty distinct skill, especially if you're selling something that's relatively complex. So, so how do you work with them to you know, gain the, the behaviors and the skills they need to be successful selling their products at the companies they're starting? Well, first we dispel some really seductive and pervasive and very dangerous myths. And you know, you, you and your community will know immediately the first one, which is, you know, Ralph Waldo, Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson's famous quote, build a better mousetrap and they'll beat a path to your door. And, you know, I sort of provocatively and somewhat meanly say that to my students on the first night of my MBA class. And I say, no, they won't. They just won't. You know, lightning does strike, but I sure as hell wouldn't count on it. And if you are counting on business, uh, if you're counting on lightning striking, you probably wouldn't be at business school in the first place because you're just super lucky. And so, you know, what we try to do is to say, you know, there's a couple myths that are seductive and pervasive and dangerous, that being one of them. A great product is a great product, and that's wonderful, and you deserve tons of credit for it, but it will not and cannot and does not sell itself. Mm -hmm. the, second, the second one is, you know, sales is a subset of marketing. If I just sit behind my, my cool new fancy laptop <laughs> and I pound out a bunch of social media stuff, I'll get a bunch of business. Again, does happen, can happen. I've been on boards of companies where it has happened, but it, it's, it's, it's in dribs and drabs. And in the very early stages of starting a business, again, you know as well as I do, 
that is a, a myth that, you know, is um, pervasive because it's easier. It's easier for me to hide behind my laptop and not have to walk into a room and literally shake your hand and look you in the eye and say, hi, Andy, I'm Craig. I'd like to talk to you today about my business. Well, That's yeah. scary. It's uncomfortable. It's awkward, right? Well, Even is, for us salespeople. Right. And it is the refuge for many entrepreneurs that, that I think is one of the real reasons for failure is that marketing is easy. Sales is hard. That's exactly right. And, and so and I'm going to get to your question. One last myth that I love to, to, to share with you and your folks is, you know, I got this cool thing. I got this growing company. I'm just going to hire some of those fancy uh, professional sales people and they'll sell it for me. And you know what? I'm careful with this one because you know what? You, you, you will. I hope you will. I hope you do. And you can. You just can't do it too early. And I tell you, I made an embarrassing mistake in my first software company. And it's embarrassing, particularly because I am a salesperson. I went out and hired salespeople too, too early. Right. And, and the reason that doesn't work and the reason it's a myth is they don't know what to do. I took the highest performing salesperson I could find, this young woman. She was based in New Orleans. I, I, I said, here's the, you know, here's the territory. We love this product. You're going to be successful. And, and she went out and failed. And she didn't fail because it was her fault. It was entirely my fault. She, we had not figured out what I call the sales model, exactly. not the business model, but the sales, the sales model. model. And, and that's, that's, and that's that what happens the all, is all the time. About. I mean, this is, this is, I mean, I, I work with CEOs and to the your exact point, I say, look, before you hire a sales rep, you need to go out and sell it. You personally need to go that's out right. and sell it because if you don't know well, why then, it's selling, then, you can't tell anybody else how to sell it. Precisely correct. I mean, that is exactly, exactly um, what I say to my, my students, my executives, my MBA students. And it's it, what's so funny about that is if you start, if you just stop with what you just said, you know, you've got to be the first salesperson. You've got to go out and talk to people. Just look at that. What does that mean? It means literally go out and talk to people. Okay. If I'm talking to people, what do I say? What are the content of my words? How am I simple and concise? How do I distill it down with skill and discipline? such that you can understand it. What we always say in the business school is people will not work to understand your message. You have to work to be understood. Exactly. And, and that's, that's, I mean, a that's totally a great, different. It's a, great, it's a great phrase. I love that. It's a totally different deal, but it means that we have to start at the beginning and we have to, and I, we literally do this. We throw students in a room and they have to walk up to the Andes of the world and say, hi, Andy, I'm Craig. I run a company called sales engine. What we do is help companies build and tune their sales engine. And then I shut my mouth. Because if I shut my mouth, chances are good things will happen and sales will begin. Because you will naturally go, oh, what does that mean? And now you and I are in a conversation. Exactly. And it's about what I can offer you or not offer you. That's, that's fine, too. If you're not an opportunity, that's fine, too. I have to qualify you out. And so what we do is we just lay out, lay out the sales process step by step from the very, very, very beginning. When you're looking at a cocktail napkin with a drawing of your potential solution on it, and we say, great, describe what's on that cocktail napkin and tell me why in a compelling way I should buy that. And I'll tell you, it's so fun because, you know, in our first week, we, we assigned something that you're familiar with, Andy, called the sales trailer, which is the one line movie trailer of mm -hmm. your business. The long and the students are like, wait a minute, I'm in an elite MBA program and this crazy professor is assigning one sentence as the week's homework. I'm going to love this class. And then they come back in week two and they go, oh, my God, was that hard? And yeah, because yep. <laughs> what I like to do is something similar is, yeah, give one sentence and then they come back and say, OK, now you get half that many words to explain what you do. That's exactly right. And if you, it, it's funny because we've I've played with this class over the last eight years and I've done it up six different ways because I like to experiment and do a little A-B testing. And sometimes if I don't explicitly tell them it's one sentence, I just say, hey, you got to be clean. You got to be simple. You got to be concise. Here's what I want you to imagine. You're literally standing in a hotel lobby. You just met somebody and they ask you what you do. What's your answer? And if I don't say it's one sentence, guess what they come back with? They'll come back with, and these are very, very smart, talented people. They'll come back with four paragraphs. Mm -hmm. And then it's a hilarious and uncomfortable moment because I literally stand in front of the class and I pull up a student. And I say, hi, I'm Craig. And then I, and they say, oh, Craig, what do you do? And then I read them the four paragraphs. And of course, by end, there's 70 people in my room sweating because it's so <laughs> uncomfortable. Because they, so they see themselves in that four word, those four paragraphs. That's exactly right. And yeah. it's, you know, it's, a, it's a discipline. You know, and we, we, you know, this, I did not invent this. I mean, brand consultancies have known this for years and years. You know, what's your brand about? You don't have four paragraphs to tell me about your brand. 
No, and I got sales you. is the same thing. You've got eight seconds to capture someone's attention. Right. right. So now another thing you talk about in the class is uh, setting expectations. Because this yes. is this is so important for, for entrepreneurs is uh, you know, not to bite off something more than they can chew. Right. That's right. Um, you know, there's there's a couple primary ways. We get it, we get it setting expectations, Andy, a whole bunch of different ways. There's a couple primary ways. You know, I always say, look, when, you know, the, the, when, when expectations first start to get set, it's in the qualifying step, which, again, I'm kind of nuts having been a career salesperson. I'm nuts that, the, you know, about the second minute that I meet you, I should start qualifying you. I need to start asking you good questions, what I call impact questions mm-hmm. and qualifying questions to determine, you know, who is this guy, Andy? What are his issues? Are any of those issues that I could solve? And now, can I share just enough with him to get him intrigued about what I might be able to offer? That's it. But in that, in that dance that you and I do, I'm going to ask you a whole bunch of qualifying questions, you know, the usual suspects, time, budget, decision maker, that sort of stuff, and then some longer tail qualifying questions that have to do specifically with my business. But that is in the spirit of setting expectations. And I'm always careful, especially with my MBA students, because my MBA students sometimes can misunderstand what it means to sell. And when I, when I say that, Andy, what I mean is they, they come to the class, and this is not pervasive, but they come to the class and they think sales is, is a synonym for manipulation. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's, again, why we go over the myths and why we unlock that, that sales is actually solving people's problems and helping them. It's not manipulating you to do something you don't want to do. And that's where, when we talk about qualifying, I say, you know, look, the minute, the minute a customer is either disqualified or you've done enough what I call determining fit to determine there is not a fit between this guy, Andy, and this guy, Craig, you're out. And the best salespeople are the ones that say, you know what, Andy, this has been really, really interesting. And I really appreciate your insights. It looks like we're not a fit, but you know what? I know of a couple other resources who are, and I'd love to connect you with them. That's what great selling looks like. Yeah. And that's because that powerful. is, that's, it's a, the right thing to do. And it's B it is, it is something that, you know, you want to talk about social love and all kinds of things that accrue to you. And that's not why you do it. You don't do it for all that, but you get that. It's exactly what you get. Yeah, so, I, I, and I led my last book with a quote from Jeff Bezos uh, from an interview he did in Harvard Business Review, where, which I thought was a great definition of selling. He said, you know, we don't make money when customers buy things. We make money when we help customers make purchase decisions. That's so great. And if people and understand that that's what they're trying to do, and sometimes the decision isn't you, as you just talked about. Well, that's exactly right. It, and, you know, there's one other thought that I'll share, and this is a little bit, um, this is a little bit of a nuance, but I think it's super important for entrepreneurs. And those, so this is one of these areas where entrepreneurial selling, I think, diverges from professional selling, having been on both sides of that fence. We also add a step to our sales process that I teach at Booth and that we, that we work with companies when we consult with them. And I call it resetting expectations. And oddly, and your community may raise their eyebrows when they hear me say this. And by the way, they may fundamentally disagree, which is fine too. We think resetting expectations is a distinct five-ish minute conversation that you have with a client after the close. Oh, absolutely. After I've closed the deal with you, <laughs> absolutely. right? Absolutely. Where I sit down. And it's almost, it's a tr- think of it as a transition to client service or account management or customer, yes. customer support or whatever you want to call it. But it's the conversation where I say, and it literally is less than five minutes, 99% of the time, I say, Andy, you know, we are so, so delighted that you're on board. We're eager to get started. One more conversation I want to have before we get started. I want to make sure you understand exactly what we're doing and what we're not doing. And it's the last half of that sentence that is really important. Because oh, I'm on my game and I've done a great job all the way through with you setting expectations, that should be a no-brain conversation where you go, yep, Craig, I see, the, I see the balance sheet. I see what you're doing and what you're not doing, and we're cool. Let's get started. We're excited. Let's go. And I say, great. I shake your hand, and we're off to the races. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's funny that you bring that. I mean, I, I love it because I write about something very similar in my books and I've practiced this with my clients and the companies I've worked with for years. Small companies, startups, so on, selling complex products was what I call the most important sales call. And it's just the one you described as after you've, after you've gotten the order. See, I set the environment say, if I'm in a competitive environment, when the customer signs the order, if you were to ask them what they purchased, what they've done is they've taken the best of everything they've heard from all the competitors and conflated it into one solution. 
And that that's, so, that's, that's what they think they're getting. That's so true. And so what you do is you meet with them after you've given, gotten the order, and you just sit down and what I, the way I handle is you just review, this is what your requirements were, this is why we proposed what we proposed, this is what we're delivering and when we're delivering it. Well, I love that. And so you and I are in violent agreement. Yeah, I, yeah, I love yeah, what I, you're I talking about. I tend to, because I'm teaching a class for MBAs, I tend to give everything labels. And so I call that resetting expectations. Then you know, I've played with this over the years. You know, is that the right label? And I'm still not sure it's the exact right well, label. That's it's not I, very that's, sexy. Well, that's why I call it the most important sales call. And yeah, people, I mean, people, I always, people, always, people always say, well, what do you mean the, the most important sales call? Well, because if, if you don't have the customer's expectations in alignment with what you're delivering, as soon as you start delivering, they're pissed off or they're that's disappointed. Exactly right. Worst way possible to start a relationship. Well, not only that, I'll add one more tiny layer to this part of our conversation, you know, and this is where I really differentiate. One of the many ways I differentiate entrepreneurial selling for professional selling, you know, if you're IBM, back to our IBM conversation, mm -hmm. if you're IBM and I completely, you know, you've, you as a buyer have completely conflated all these competitors and I haven't done a, I haven't done a really clear job of telling you what you're getting and what you're not getting and we go forward and you completely get pissed off at me and IBM, guess what? IBM can survive that. It's, you know, it's just, it's just $350,000. Right. It's right. not going to take the company down. Exactly. If you do Great that as point. an entrepreneur, good luck. Yeah. Cause you could be in, you could be in existential trouble doing that as an entrepreneur. And oh. I've done it. I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's, that's a great point. Excellent. All right. So, so you, let's move on a little bit. You, so you'd referred earlier to the sales trailer. We talked about yeah. that, which I love the, I love the metaphor of the sales trailer. You think about a movie trailer, sales trailer, um, so then you have this this concept of a story matrix, and I love talking about. And I talk about my latest books is is you know you need to have these thirty second sales stories, and you call them sales anecdotes, which I think is a great a great title, but very similar. So talk very about similar. your talk about your story matrix. Sure, I mean this is a tool that comes from my book called What's Your Story, and it's a it's a book that I wrote some years ago that just tries to get at. How do we as leaders and salespeople tell stories that really ignite performance and just connect to people, engage people in a different way? So I got, I was running a software company that we actually pulled stories and shaped them out of large organizations and then redeployed them across that organization to connect them to important topics. So sales negotiations, ethics, ethical dilemmas, leadership, product development, that sort of stuff. I got really interested in why stories work and the psychology. And again, this is sort of my nerdy academic side coming out. Why do, why do stories actually connect? Why, are we, why have we as humans shared stories over the millennia? And so that's, that's a whole different part of our conversation that we don't have to have today. But it's, that's fascinating. And I continually learn uh, how, that, how the psychology of stories actually works. What I did in my book is I said, okay, if we just accept that, if we all as salespeople on this, on this podcast, we accept that, look, telling a great story, telling the, what I say is telling the right story at the right time for the right reasons. If we accept that that's powerful and influential and convincing, then the question becomes, okay, what story are you going to tell? And this again is where I'm a classic salesman. Like, give me the tools. Where are the stories? Andy, tell me the five stories I should tell about this company so I can go tell them. So I can go into that hotel lobby and tell them. Because so you got to have them to tell them. And I came up with this story matrix, and it's not, it's not the matrix from the movie. It's, it's much more boring and simple than that, but it's literally just a spreadsheet. It's a grid, and it has four types of stories across the tops and the columns, and then it has situations. Each row is a different situation where you would need to tell stories. So mm -hmm. I'm early in a customer relationship. That might, be a, that might be a row, or I'm hiring people for my cool team. That might be a row. Hiring, uh, hiring and onboarding might be a row leadership, you want to boil it up to high topics, like, you know, high level topics, leadership, culture, you'd have a whole row of stories on culture. And the columns across the top are important. And we explore this a lot in my book, What's Your Story, where I look at the four types of stories leaders are telling. Success, failure, fun, and legends. And I think those are all obvious definitions. You know, legend is I tell you a story about Steve Jobs, he's a legend. Mm -hmm. Or I tell you a story, you know, Andy, 300 years ago, a man was traveling across the world, you know, a, a sort of a historic, mythical, right. um, religious, spiritual teaching story. That's, a, that's another definition of a legend. But, you know, salespeople tell fun stories. We should tell successes, obviously. We should also tell failures, um, which is a really interesting topic when you start to unlock the psychology behind. If I tell you a failure story, 
why does that actually impact you and affect you in a positive way more than a success story? That's often counterintuitive for salespeople and executives. You know, I work with a lot of CEOs in my executive education and executive MBA teaching at Booth, and that's often counterintuitive for them, too, because they want to be, you know, they are already successful, well, they and they want to channel those. They want all five-star reviews, and they don't seem right. to understand that these days people look with suspicion on five-star reviews if that's all you have. Well, that's right. I mean, the best example I have in my personal life of that is um, – I, you know, I got my second opportunity to lead a company. It was a turnaround of a business that was struggling. And when I interviewed the final time for that position with the main investor, who was in a major, major force in Silicon Valley, I told him my failure stories from my first business. I said, here's all the things that I screwed up. And his reaction to that was, I mean, some of them were embarrassing, like just really dumb decisions. And his, his reaction to that was so interesting and why failure stories are so important. His reaction was, well, at least you won't make those mistakes mm -hmm. this time because you're able to articulate them. If I had walked in there with my chest pumped up, and I did tell him some success stories that I'm super proud of, but not many. But if I'd walked in with my chest pumped up and said, hey, I'm the smartest guy in the room, I never would have gotten that job. Not in, the heart, not in a million years. Well, and also what you're doing is you're, you're basically letting the prospect know that You've gone through, you've learned the lessons, you've gone through the difficult period, and maybe the competitors haven't. By virtue of not telling those stories, perhaps they haven't learned those lessons yet. The, le the lessons from experience, that's exactly right. I mean, it's, it, you're so right. I mean, what I always say is failure stories do a lot of things, but if you boil the psychology down to its, to its at least what I think is its essence, it is they demonstrate that you are a learner, which is really important. And then they demonstrate the ultimate, which is humility. Right. If I'm able to look you in the eye and I, it's got to be authentic. I can't be, I can't be just making it up. It's got to be an authentic failure. And by the way, we've all failed. So it's, it can be authentic. Right. And just say, look, Andy. So, you know, you asked me for an example, here's an example of how I screwed that up six ways to Sunday. And I really regret that because, and, and you're going to ask me naturally, you're going to say, Craig, holy crap. What'd you learn? And I'm going to get a chance to tell you how I sort of turned it around or what I learned or, you know, after I licked my wounds, I figured this out, Andy. But it's, it's, it's only then that we should then be telling the, the more successful side of that story. I always say to my students, sit down into your failures. It's okay. Right. You will actually connect and be magnetic to people if you do that. You're because you're human. Right. right. People, people buy from people, but only if they're human. <laughs> so, uh, well, one other thing then, before we get to the last segment of the show, I want to touch this because you brought it up earlier. You talked about the impact questions. Yeah. And so describe what, what impact questions are to you. Because, again, this is another area I'm sure we're in violent agreement on. I've, I, in my book, I call them killer questions, but it's, it's the same concept. And you talk about it in a recent video, and I love the way you expressed it because that's exactly what I, what, I, <laughs> what I agree with. So maybe talk about impact questions. Well, so and I, again, you and I are definitely in agreement. I mean, I, you, you call them killer questions. I think Google calls them killer questions as well. There's a great consulting firm out of Boston that calls them high gain questions. So I'm just trying to be different and fancy with my little impact word. I just like the word impact because I want, I want you to come out of a meeting having had an impact in that meeting. And one of the ways we animate that impact or manifest it is in the questions we ask. Here's what we know. We know that high performing salespeople get better, more actionable information from their customers. Why? Because they ask better questions. Mm -hmm. And so the question about questions is, you, you know, I'm going into a sales meeting, you're going into a sales meeting tomorrow. And are you, what I always like to ask is, are you conscious and deliberate about the questions you're asking? Or are you going to ask all the average questions? And let me be super careful here. There is nothing wrong with asking the average questions. There's nothing wrong with me walking into your office tomorrow. You don't know me very well, or you don't know me at all. And we're having a sales conversation. And I say, Andy, you know, how's your quarter shaping up? There's nothing wrong with that question. That's a really good question. It's just an impact question. Why? Because the answer is right in the front of your mind. Mm -hmm. And what I always do, so, so definitely, definitionally, de the, the definition of impact questions are, they go deeper, they go broader, and the answer is not right on the front of your mind. They and have to you, stop and think. They have to stop and think. And the cool thing is every single person listening to the, this podcast has asked a, a gazillion what I call impact questions. You know you have because somebody went, huh, 
That's a good, let me think about that. That's a good question, right? You've all got, we've all gotten that reaction. I'm just saying, okay, prepare for that reaction. Prepare to get that reaction. Walk in to that CEO's office and tw- not, not in the first minute. It would be, it's too, it'd be like me walking and hugging you. That would be too, too close, <laughs> right? That's just too weird. But 20 minutes in, great time for an impact question to say, hey, you know, to Andy, the CEO. So Andy, you know, you've been painting a picture of this year and it's really interesting and compelling. Let me ask you a question. If we get to the end of this year and that picture has gone completely to hell, what does that look like? And what does it feel like? That's, that's what I think is an impact question, right? It's kind of the, you know, the, the, the cheesy version of that is what keeps you up at night. It's a, it's, I think it's a better way oh, to yeah, get that, at, that and it's a little better. edgy. You know, I said the word hell, you know, right. I don't think anybody will hold that against me. I've literally asked CEOs of fortune 20 companies that question. And I'll tell you what, it stops them in their tracks. And that's exactly what I want. I want them to go, damn, let me think about that. Well, and then it, they start to unspool all this really interesting stuff. And guess what that is? That's better, more actionable information for me, whether right. it benefits me or whether it doesn't. Again, that's back to our qualify. It might qualify me out as a solution, but I sure as hell is going to, I'm going to understand after that 40 minutes with that CEO, I will, I will get much farther and deeper than the usual person if I'm on my game. Yeah. And, I, and for people listening, and I've, I've brought this up a couple of times before is, Another way to think about these impact questions or killer questions is you're going to ask the prospect something about their business that they should know, but don't. Right, right. That's a great way to frame it. <laughs> so if you think about it, something they should know, but don't, uh, that'll p- cause them to pause and, and think. And yeah, that's, that's... That, that gives you a lot of level of credibility and perception of you having some insight into their business that you can build on. Yeah, I love that. That's a great way to frame it. All right. Well, now, Craig, we move into the last segment of the show where I've got some standard questions I ask all my guests. Yeah. And the first one's a hypothetical scenario. And you've probably been in this situation. You've just been hired as VP of sales at a company whose sales have stalled out. Time to hit the reset button, get things back on track. CEO, board are all anxious for it to happen. So what two steps would you take in your first week on the job that could have the biggest impact? Oh, gosh, I love this question. Let me think about this for a second. I know the first step. Well, I know both steps. So I did this in my turnaround company, and this is the reason we turned the company around. One of the things that I would do, one of the two things I would do, Andy, right off the bat, is quickly assess the three things of each person on the team and each person that surrounds that sales team, the their, their level of knowledge, skill, and discipline. And just quickly, I like those three things. They're, they're, those three pillars are or, or found, they serve as a foundation for my, my MBA courses and everything I do in my consulting work. I like to look at and assess the knowledge, skill, and discipline. And I believe strongly in my reading of the sales research and, and my experience as a salesperson and entrepreneur that it is the proper balance of those three things that makes up high performance. So I'm going to want to know, is Andy strong on all three factors? Is he not as knowledgeable, which by the way, would not concern me at all. Um, it would concern me if you were not skilled and disciplined. That's what would concern me. Knowledge we can fix, skill and disciplines. We can fix two, but it's harder. So those, that's one thing I would assess. And then or the one thing I would do. And then the second thing I would do is what we did in my turnaround company is we started um, really putting those three things to action by doing a blitz. So I would, I would put us into a sprint mm-hmm. where we would cold call, generate as many leads, qualify, push prospects as far into the sales pipeline as possible right off the bat. The reason I do that is not to make people uncomfortable, although it does, and not to be sort of a tyrant. The reason I do that is to figure out what have I got. Right. So have I got people that will come in and make 70 calls before lunch? Or have I got people, and you know, we discovered goods and bads in our turnaround company where we had people that said, you know, this is so far out of my comfort zone, I'm not doing it. And that tells you one story. And we had people that said, God, I hate this, but I'll do it. And that told you a different story. And, and, and usually those are the people that, that were incredibly successful. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 that's a great answer because you get to assess the level of commitment to the mission going forward, which is really important. You, you find out so much stuff. I mean, we right. did a series of sprints over weeks and, and it was hard for all of us. And I did it right alongside them. I, didn't, I never asked anybody to do something I won't do. And so I was making 250 calls a week and we were just pounding. And I was terrible at it for the first couple of weeks until I really learned what the heck I was talking about. 
And but man, you learn a lot about the culture of the company in that in that sprint. All right, excellent answer. Okay, we've got some rapid fire questions then. Yep. You can give me one word answers or elaborate if you wish. The first one is when you, Craig, are out selling your services for sales engine, what's your most powerful sales attribute? Simplicity. It's it's what we've talked about. It's the it's being able to say when it's people that give people crisp answers. Mm-hmm. So who's your sales role model? Uh, a guy named Keith Harrell at IBM who came in to talk to us and had a profound influence on me. He was a golden circle winner, which means the top of the top at IBM. Um, big, boisterous guy, incredibly talented. And I looked at him and said, I want to be that guy. Great answer. Other than your own book, what's a book every salesperson should read? Give and Take by Adam Grant out of Wharton Business School. Give and Take, okay. Maybe a new one for me. Fantastic. One of the best books I've read in the last five years. Going on my list with that recommendation. Okay. And last question. That's always the tough one. What music's on your playlist these days? Oh, I just heard a great rap song and I don't, and I'm not a huge rap guy, but I love this song and I I love rap, but I just don't listen to it a lot. Um, gosh, I don't know what the name of the song is, Andy, but I can tell you how to find it. There's a, there's a movie that was just made. I think it went straight to Netflix or whatever, but it's George Clooney and Julia Roberts. Oh, I'm sorry. George Clooney and Julia Roberts. Um, Oh, the financial one. Yes, yes, yes. The financial one. It's the song that plays over the credits right at the end. I'm sorry that I can't be more specific. <laughs> we're going to research that and we're going to find out what that well, is. I'm so sorry. That's no such a lame answer, but it's a great song and I've been rocking to it for the last week. <laughs> okay, great. Well, Craig, thanks for joining me and uh, tell people how they can connect with you. Uh, thank you for asking. So I'm on LinkedIn at, at Sales Engine or at Craig Wartman. And just so every clarify my name, it's W-O-R-T as in Tom. And then man with two N's, M-A-N-N. So W-O-R-T-M-A-N-N. So at Craig Wartman or at Sales Engine is probably the best. My, my website's super simple. It's salesengine.com. Um, so we're on LinkedIn and we're on Twitter at Sales Engine. Um, and obviously you can hit me on LinkedIn and I'd love to, love to uh, be part of the community. Excellent. Well, good. Well, again, thanks again. And remember, friends, make it a part of your day every day to deliberately learn something new to help you accelerate your success. And one easy way to do that is take a minute and subscribe to this podcast, Accelerate, because then you won't miss any of my conversations with top business experts like my guest today, Craig Wartman, who shared his expertise about how to accelerate the growth of your business. So thanks for joining me. Until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guests, visit my website at andypaul.com.